This week, the war jumps back into action as the rebels move to recover from their recent defeats. But what is this, a western ship? President Davis is trying to rally and revitalize rebel spirit as his chosen warrior Hood goes on the offensive. This week is the start of a new phase of the war. Let's dig in. Let's start off with the devil of the saddle, Forrest. He spends the week burning down federal infrastructure from northern Alabama to Tennessee. Which, when you look at the map, isn't that much. But this is just preparation for more. The second, General Pierre Gustave Dutant Beauregard takes over the Department of the West. I see why we just call him PGT. A newly created department, which covers all states west of Florida to the mighty Mississippi. This moves PGT from Petersburg down south, watching over the armies of Hood and Taylor. Hood's army is marching north, hoping to force Sherman from Georgia by cutting northward. Rebel officer Alexander P. Stewart has been swiftly capturing small depots, but the fort at Alatoona presents the biggest challenge yet. The Division of Senior Chief French are sent to secure it. Truman replies in kind, sending General John Corse with his brigade to reinforce the defenders. Outnumbered by the rebels three to two, fighting will be difficult, but hopefully the earthen works will be enough. Midnight passes and the rebels appear, positioning their heavy guns, preparing for a grand assault. Boom! The sound of cannons break the silence just as day breaks. But delays has their assault fall behind schedule, and French tries diplomacy to avoid a needless effusion of We are prepared for the needless effusion. We are prepared for the needless effusion of blood. Whenever it is agreeable to you. Blood. Brigades of Hood snap down on the defenders, striking from the north and west. For five hours, the Confederates charge. For five hours, the Confederates charge course, and for five hours, they are held at bay. 900 men fewer, and further Federal reinforcements bearing down, French falls back, defeated. I'm short a cheekbone and ear, but I'm able to whip all hell yet. Tennessee campaign starts with a defeat. Likely this will be followed up soon, as more men of Sherman begin the chase of the Confederates. Politics, and let's start with something peculiar. Lincoln's substitute. Private John S. Staples is approached by a representative of the president, given $500 to serve in his stead. Because, yeah, I guess the president wasn't technically exempt from the draft, though he is too old. This is all just to set a good example. His rival Davis is returning from a southern journey. Fifth, he's in Columbia, South Carolina, on his way back to Richmond. His eye is now fixed upon a point beyond that where he was assailed by the enemy. And if but a half, nay, one-fourth of the men to whom the service has a right will give him their strength, I see no chance for Sherman to escape from a defeat or a disgraceful retreat. To Virginia! First, Saltville. General Burbridge and the 5th U.S. Colored Cavalry charge into their opponents, but repulsed. Those left behind are slaughtered. We surely slew Negroes that day. Watching in horror as a Confederate guerrilla, the notorious Champ Ferguson calmly walked about the battlefield, killing white prisoners as well as blacks. Brutality is shared by both sides, though not in magnitude. Sheridan in the Valley continues his burning, and when a topographer is killed while surrendering, an entire town is destroyed in retribution. Leave nothing for the subsistence of an army. The 6th, the rebels tried to strike back as Officer Roster's regiment charged Custer, but failed to stop the destruction. Farms, fields, homes, stores, once targeted, nothing can save them. Though none are intentionally killed, sometimes the blaze trying to rescue their life's work, fortunately losing their life along with their belongings. Brazil, let me explain. France, Cherbourg. The famed Confederate commerce raider, the CSS Alabama, met its demise at the hands of the USS Kearsarge, leaving its sister, the CSS Florida, the final major rebel raider. Where have I said that before? The Kearsarge sister, the USS Wachawada Buena, was ordered to pursue the Florida to the edge of the earth, which happened to be off Brasilia Bahia. Before morning light on the 7th, Federal Commander Collins orders a ramming of his opponent's vessel. It's a glancing blow, which due to a common event actually does some damage to the mast. As it's the middle of the night, much of the Florida's crew are on land. Those who are on the ship return fire with pistol. Not wishing to escape too much in neutral harbor, Collins responds with cannons, which is an international crime. He then asks for the surrender, it's refused. He threatens to open fire again, and he gets his prize. Some rebels on board decide to try to swim for it, nine drowning. The two ships are linked, and the watch of woods is being me. He gets to tow its glory back to federal waters. But right now, it's in Brazilian waters, 
who's a Navy now to the gross violation of their waters, try to chase Collins down, but he escapes. They're shot sinking behind the vessel. So what does the brave Collins get for his glorious victory? A court-martial, because of course he caused an international incident, idiot. Final theater of the war, Petersburg. With Beauregard gone, Lee's alone holding Grant down. The battle around Peebles Farm continues. On the first, in a cavalry engagement, the rebels are repulsed, losing Bird General John Donovan. The second, General Gershom Mott reinforces his federal friends. With his numbers, breaks any force, securing victory, though at a heavy cost. Lee tries to counterattack on the seventh with the divisions of Robert Hoke and Charles Field, pushing back the Mountain Man of Grant, but repulsed when the Blue Infantry arrive. In the chaos, Rebel General John Gregg is killed. Sickles' time, he writes to the Philadelphia National Union Club, politely declining an invitation to speak. What is very important is Sickles' writing on James Buchanan. Buchanan, he claims, denied the right to secession, while also deeming it unconstitutional to use force. Which is pretty kind to the 15th president. But that doesn't last long. But now it is maintained by those who have succeeded to the control of the great party which elected Mr. Buchanan, the only have a peace on the basis of the Federal Union is through a convention of the states, or other peaceable means. Sickles condemns this thinking, saying it would be tantamount to surrender. That's where the week ends, and looking at it, we see the rebellion really trying to use its last bit of strength to turn the tides, but desperately trying to force Sherman from Georgia to no success. In the valley, Jubal are powerless to stop Sheridan, and Lee's counterattacks costing them manpower and officers. The only question now is, will President Lincoln see us to the grinding down of Davis, or will McClellan come to save secession? Hi, it's the entire Civil War Week by Week team here, and I would just like to thank every single one of you guys for watching. I'm after the last video and the Project Tome coming before it and the video before that. I've seen a lot of support, and I just want to thank every single one of you guys for sticking around. Look at the numbers, I can tell people going back to school has really decreased viewership. And it's still an honor just knowing that you guys will spend your free time listening to me talk about, well, the Civil War, throwing in my attempts at comedy and my research. It's, it really means a lot. Thank you. I hope to see you next week.